Well, good morning, everybody, and happy Easter. I'm Pastor Ken, the senior pastor here at Vertical Church, and it's wonderful. Thank you all for coming and celebrating with us, because the foundation of all that we believe rests in what we celebrate today. And if you're here and you're just visiting with us, we well, thank you that you're here. Forgive us for our appearance. As you can see, we're in the middle of something right now. We're doing a renovation. We're creating space to create community. We'd love you all to come back and see it when it's finished because we're creating a space where people can connect and build community together right here at Vertical. And so we're excited about that. But today, we started a series last week called Tough as Nails. And the reason I did that is because it goes so adequately with what this day is all about. In fact, if you're with us and you've never been a part of it, you can catch up. You can watch any message we've ever done online, free of charge, anytime you want. But we talk about it. Let me catch up real quickly to where we were because Jesus was tough as nails. And because he was, we can be. But the problem we're facing in Christianity today is we have a branding problem. And what does that mean? Branding, it's what people think of when they think about you, your product, or your organization. Now think with me for a moment. If you're a Christian, what should people think of when they hear the term Christian? And if you're not a Christian, thank you that you're here. Maybe the reason you're not a Christian is because of Christians you've encountered, people that you've known, and they've kind of turned you off to the whole. And therefore, what comes to your mind when you think of the term Christian? I mean, people fill in the blanks with so many different things. In today's culture, people think judgmental, hypocritical, all sorts of things. And that's where we have a branding problem, but probably the word that never comes to mind when people hear the term Christian is the word fearless. But Jesus was fearless. And because he was, so can we be. And this is where we left off last week, and that's this, that uncertainty is unavoidable, but fear is optional. Isn't that true? You know, uncertainty, we live in a day of unprecedented uncertainty. There's economic uncertainty, there's political uncertainty, there's terrorism and violence all around us in our world. So uncertainty is unavoidable, but fear is optional. Why? Because faith is the antidote to fear. And that's why it's important. What is our faith founded on? What is our faith? based on. Because today, on Easter Sunday, this is what we all celebrate, but it is the very foundation for all that we believe. In fact, if you're taking notes, listen, faith in a resurrected Savior is the foundation for a fearless life. Faith in a resurrected Savior. Because the followers of Jesus, fascinating to me, that Jesus entered in Jerusalem in plain sight, knowing all that awaited him. We talk about, we just came through it, we celebrated in the church world as Holy Week, all that Jesus endured, all that he went through for you and I. But Jesus had told his disciples before he ever even entered Jerusalem, all that would happen to him. In fact, in, in epic detail, he told them that the chief priests and elders would arrest him. They would try him. They would find him guilty of murder or, 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 or condemn him to murder. They would turn him over to the Gentiles who would mock him, flog him, and ultimately crucify him. And then he said this to them, and on the third day, it rise again. Now, here's a fascinating point to me is that when you read the depictions of the followers of Jesus, look at this, John, one of Jesus' closest followers, wrote this. He said, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with doors locked. Why? For fear of the Jewish leaders. What's fascinating to me, when you read the gospel accounts, see, the Bible, the New Testament, is a collection of ancient manuscripts. And the first four that we hold in the New Testament, we call them gospels, they were eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus. And here, it wasn't written like legend or fairy tale. In fact, the writers of them depicted the truth because they didn't even write themselves into the story as heroes. They told it 
as it was, they were just regular human beings, just people like you and me. And here, even though Jesus had told them what would happen, they didn't believe it. When Jesus was arrested, when Jesus was crucified, they thought, it's over. Everything we believed about him must not have been true. And so what were they doing? They were hiding in fear behind locked doors from the Jewish leaders. Why the Jewish leaders? They were the ones that had arrested Jesus. They had it in their own authority to arrest his followers as well. But what happened? Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. What's so fascinating is why would they write the story this way if they wanted everybody to believe it? You know, you would have written it if you were thinking about it from a legend point of view. They would have been on the third day at the tomb waiting for the sun to rise and counting down 10, 9, 8. No, they were nowhere to be found. They were behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. Look at how Luke writes it. Luke writes it this way. While they were still talking about this, all that had happened, they were talking about Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Well, look at verse 37. And they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw, what? A ghost. Why? Because when people die, they generally stay dead. They were seeing something that was overwhelming. They watched him die. They watched him persecuted. They watched him with all that had happened. And here, he's standing in their midst. So they figure, it's got to be a ghost. And so what does Jesus do? Verse 38. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Verse 39. He said, look at my hands and feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see me have. In other words, Jesus says, okay, guys, come on, right here. Touch me. Feel me. It's me, guys. And what happens? Look at verse 30, I mean, verse 40. It says, and when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet in verse 41. And how'd they respond? And while they still did not believe it. Are you kidding me? Even with him standing there, saying, handle me. Because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And what happens? Verse 41, 42, and they gave him a piece of boiled fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. And then, only then, did they believe. It always kind of amazed me. Why is it that we Christians can't ever get together without food being around? Okay, maybe it just started right there. I don't know, but listen. And he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. In other words, guys, can I remind you? I told you all that would happen. Yet they didn't believe it. All of the disciples lost faith. All of them turned away. All of them thought it was over. None of them were fearless until something happened that changed everything. And what was it? He said, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. The resurrection of Jesus changed everything because those once fearful, cowardly disciples then went out into the public streets. The same crowds that called for Jesus to be crucified. Peter, the one that denied Jesus three times, the night in which he was betrayed, when just a servant girl said, you're one of his followers. And he swears, no, I don't know who he is. Even though Jesus told them that would happen. What's fascinating to me is they had heard him say it, but now his resurrection changed everything. And Peter could go out into the streets and to the same crowds that had cried for Jesus' death just a few weeks before. Here was his message. God sent him. You crucified him. God raised him from the dead. Say you're sorry because God has made this Jesus both Lord and Messiah. There is no other name under heaven whereby men might be saved. See, all of your reasons to fear begin to dissipate and disappear because if, if the one that you believe in can conquer death, hell, and the grave. Who had ever done that? What religion was ever strong enough to say that the, that the answer to death rested in the one 
who was the author of the faith. Jesus, he changed everything. And every one of those disciples, in fact, when people look at the evidence, see, Christianity is not based on somebody saying, I had a revelation, or I, it's based on eyewitness evidence. It's based on facts, that there is a tomb that is empty. There is no body that was found. That Jesus' enemies could have immediately dispelled the entirety by just bringing out, look it, we have the evidence here. No, he was risen. But one of the greatest things in all history, one of the greatest facts about the faith that we stand upon was the change that occurred in these men that were the followers of Jesus because they became fearless because now no longer did anything deter them from the mission and to tell the message of good news to all mankind. Some people say, well, maybe they stole the body. Maybe this was a conspiracy. But listen to me, how many people die violent deaths for something they know is a lie? Every one of Jesus' closest followers, when you read the historical evidences, each of them died violent deaths for the things that they believe, but they no longer feared death. They no longer feared the circumstances because their faith is in a resurrected Savior. And if he's overcome, then guess what? We overcome. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Because the good news went deeper. And that's what I want to talk to us about today. Because listen, the very core of it, what we fear today, we may not fear tomorrow. When I was a kid, I had fears about things. You know, I grew up in Stanford, okay? My sisters are a lot older than me, and they used to watch a, a, a daytime soap opera called Dark Shadows, okay? And as a kid, I was scared of vampires, okay? But guess what? I'm not, I don't fear vampires anymore, because some things are not based on fact, right? During the days of Columbus, the very sailors that were in those times were scared that the world was flat, and if you got too close, you'd fall off. And then they discovered that wasn't real. But then there are other things. A hundred years ago, people feared polo. But now, today, polo's been cured. So we don't fear, we don't fear polo anymore. Polio, excuse me. Thank you, babe. We don't fear polio anymore, do we? Because there's a vaccine for it whether it's cancer, whether it's other things, because when there's a cure, when there's a solution, when there is an answer, it begins to alleviate our fears. And where did fear begin? Where did it enter into the human experience? It was right at the beginning, right at the very start of the human experience. God had made a perfect world, but mankind rebelled. Mankind sinned, and you know what happened when sin entered the garden? The very first human response was fear. Man ran, man hid, man covered up, man was scared. When God called, Adam said, I was scared. Because the things that we fear most, and here's the point, the longer I live, I realize this. We all know what we have done wrong. We all understand the things that we've done. Maybe other people don't. I had a discussion with an older gentleman a few weeks ago. And he was telling me because he was remembering back to all the things he was dealing with because there are things inside our consciousness where we know we've messed up. Now, we may have told stories to others. We may have even have told ourselves things. But there are things that haunt us. There are things that sometimes stay with us. And the ultimate penalty for sin was death. And mankind feared death. Why? Because when it was all over, the accountability of life would be shown for what it was. And that's why the good news of Jesus, yeah, I want you to listen carefully to me today. Hebrews 2 says it this way. Look it. It says, Hebrews 2, 9, but we see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. See, the identity of who Jesus is is critical to our faith. Who is Jesus? 
And what did he accomplish? Look at verse 14. He says this. And since children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Verse 15. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. You see, there is a sense inside of us when you know what you've done that someday, somehow, that might come out. I remember when I was, you know, one of the, one of the trilogies I love to watch, The Godfather, sorry, it's a man thing. But Michael Corleone dealt with the guilt within himself. If you ever watch it in the third one, he had ordered the murder of his brother Fredo. And here was this tough mob boss, but guess what? Down deep, he dealt with the regret, the condemnation, and the guilt that he carried for ordering the death of his brother. You see, what is it we fear in that? That somehow it brings punishment. That somehow, is there ever a reckoning? Is there ever a point of accountability? Is there ever a point? You see, when I was a kid, let me tell you a story. When I was a kid, my mom brought me home a pair of sneakers from, from the store back then. And, you know, it was a pair of cons, and I wanted to wear them. And back then, they had this, the, the, the sneakers were held together by this plastic piece. And my mom had dropped them off, and then she went out with my sister shopping. My dad was home alone. We lived in a very small house in Stanford. My dad was sitting in the kitchen, and I went into my bedroom. I wanted to wear these sneakers so bad, I pulled out a Cub Scout knife that I had. Now, my dad didn't know I had that Cub Scout knife, but I pulled out that knife, and I was cutting away at that plastic piece, wanting to, you know, put on these sneakers. So I had a break. So I'm putting all my effort and all my into it, and, and, and all of a sudden, the knife finally went through the plastic, but there was so much force that I was pushing with that the knife went straight into my eye. I can't even begin to tell you how painful that was. I stabbed myself in the eye with a knife. Well, I screamed, and I ran out into the kitchen. But you see, as a child, I was scared to death of my father. And somehow I believed in that moment that if I told my dad that I stabbed myself with a knife, he would literally kill me. So I told him that I tripped and fell. And I fell on a bedpost. And my dad said what my dad would normally say. Well, stop crying. Only girls cry. Put some ice on it and shut up. So I waited. My mother came home a little while later. My mom was a registered nurse. She sat by my bedside. I did not sleep a moment that night. By 5 a.m. in the morning, my mother finally said to my father, we need to get this kid to the hospital. There is something wrong. They took me to the hospital, little Chinese doctor who took one look into my eye. I'll remember this like it's yesterday. We took him right out, took my parents into the other room. And at that point, the waiting room, it had this glass barrier between the two. So I saw him and he basically yelled at my parents and said, you could, this kid could lose his sight. Do you realize how severe this is? Just by the grace of God, a gentleman had just graduated, graduated the top uh, uh, optometry school in the nation. And he had set up business in Stanford, Dr. Bullwinkle. And they called him, and he saw me specially. And by that evening, I went in for surgery. I went through three surgeries. He saved my sight. But do you know, for 20 years, I never told anybody what really happened. Why? Because, you know, sometimes things just mount. They get bigger. How do you unwind it? And here, that may sound silly to you, but here's the problem. In this room, there are a whole lot of secrets. There are things you've been telling yourself. There have been things you've been telling other people. And you're scared that if ever it came out, and what is it we're scared of? What's the consequence? What's the punishment? What would actually occur? But here's the good news. Look at this in Hebrews. He says, For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. Verse 17. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human, in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. So let me tell you the good news, because it's found in the, in the identity of who Jesus is. 
See, nobody, when something is done wrong, if you're violated, if somebody does something against you, what is it generally you as a human being want? Justice, isn't it? Nobody feels good when somebody who has done something horrible just walks away scot-free, right? Does anybody feel good about that? Unless you're the person who's guilty. And whenever you find yourself in a situation where you are guilty, what is it you want in that moment? Generally not justice. Usually you want mercy and grace. Do you not? And here's the, here's the situation. To understand God, how can God ultimately be just? And how can God be merciful at the same time? And here's where the situation where human beings struggle. Because if God is not just, then how can you trust him? If God is not just, then how can you believe anything he says he will actually accomplish and do? If he's not righteous, if he's not just. But how can God be just and at the same time merciful and loving and gracious and kind? And that's the power of what we celebrate. Because Jesus, and this is what defies human logic, it's what's shaken the very foundation of all human belief systems. Because when you do wrong, what's the answer? We all know it. But when we turn to religion, religion generally tells us what? Do good. Try to do something. We do penance. We try to do. Because what is it immediately you feel in the moment when you do wrong? Oh my good. What can I do to do right? How can I do that? Because we have some idea, some belief system that if we do good enough, then maybe we can bypass the wrong we've done. Because isn't it true, Pastor Ken, that good people go to heaven? Well, that's what a lot of religions teach. But that's not what Christianity is based on. No, the Bible doesn't actually teach that at all. Because here's the fallacy to that idea. If doing good could make it right, then how much good would you need to do to make it right? And that's why all mankind has feared death since the beginning. Because how will you ever know how can you be free from the fear of punishment, retribution for the wrongs we've done until you understand the cross? Because Jesus was God Almighty who became human. That defies human logic. Why would the God of heaven, the creator of all, see in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And through him all things were made. So who could ever stand in for every single human being who ever lived? If it was God who became human, could not his life be given representing all mankind? But who would ever love us that much? Who would ever take a punishment that they didn't deserve. You see, in Christ, what you find is the reconciliation of God between his justice and his mercy. Because Jesus took what every single human being was guilty of before God. The book of Romans, it says it this way, that whatever things the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that all the world might find guilty. Because no matter how much we try, what all of us know down deep is that all of us have messed up. No matter how hard we try and make promises, we'll never do things again. What we do is disappoint ourselves, much less anybody else. But the Bible tells us, so that all the world would stand accountable. But there is a righteousness from God that is witnessed to by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, in Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them, listen, who believe. For there is no 
difference. You want to know what unites every one of us in this room today? Here it is. For all have sinned, and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, whom God justified us freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Undo all, because God set forth Christ as a propitiation, a mercy offering, through faith in his blood that he might be just and the justifier of all them that believe. Now, I'll just share with you, that's Romans 3, but listen to me. Listen to me. What does that all mean? That God left sins that went before and sins that would occur unpunished until the coming of the one who would bring redemption for everyone who believes. You got to be kidding me. It can't be that simple. It can't be that easy. It defies human logic. But here's the truth. In fact, this is it. Listen. Faith in a resurrected Savior. Go, go here. Faith in a resurrected Savior removes, faith in a resurrected Savior removes the fear of punishment and abandonment. What did we fear? Because you see this? When you begin to embrace the gospel, the Bible teaches us there is no fear in love. For perfect love drives out fear because fear ha ha fears punishment. But God demonstrated his love for mankind. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you and I. In other words, the gospel proclaims this realization that to put your faith in Christ is the realization that everything has been paid in full. That Jesus' death was sufficient for the sins of humanity. There's nothing I can do that can make it right with God, but I can believe in Christ, in Christ alone. And when I do, my fear of actually ever facing God begins to dissipate, begins to disappear. Then no longer do I have to fear because the punishment for my sins was born in him. That is good news. What do we have to fear? But the last one is this, rejection. All of us have struggled with this act because we fear that if anybody ever really knew our secrets, would they love us? Would they stay with us? Would they be by our side? But Jesus, in his love, look at this. In Hebrews 2.18, it says this, or 2.19, excuse me. No, no, Hebrews 2.18. Go to this. No, go to 2.18, guys. 19, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. I can't quote it. Let me read it to you. Hold on, hold on. I do have it, hold on. It says this. It says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. In other words, here's the point. You will never, when you have faith in Christ, will you ever be alone. And why is that good news? Because who knew what you did, even when you weren't willing to admit it to anybody else, maybe not even yourself? You ever watch people try to take responsibility for something that they've done wrong? The, most, the more excuses we make, you wonder at the end of somebody trying to tell you, I'm sorry, you wonder if you should even feel like they did anything wrong. Because we put such a pretty face on the horror, but who knows what we have done more than anyone else? It's Jesus. But you see, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. The only one who had the right to condemn you is the one that doesn't condemn you at all. Why? Because his hands and his feet are the proof that the life he gave was the, was the restoration, the freedom from the penalties of your sins. They have been paid in full. And then here is the good news. Jesus told the disciples, and going into all the world and sharing this message, he said, Lo, I am with you always, even 
to the end of the age. And here is the ultimate good news, my friends, that the God who loves you will never leave you. When you put your faith in Christ, everyone else may leave you. Everyone else may abandon you. But you can have this one confidence to be sure of beyond any shadow of a doubt that God is faithful to his promises. He rose from the dead. He defeated all that stood against him. And he has made the declaration, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You do not need to fear punishment and you do not need to fear abandonment because when you place your faith in Jesus Christ he is a savior who is with you always you see you may try to run you may try to you may try to uh, 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 forget about it you may try to pretend like it's not so but God is there God stands ready he's ready to forgive he's ready to heal he's ready to restore He's ready to give you a second chance, a third chance. He's ready to help you. But you see, Jesus came to save sinners. When we admit, God, yeah, I'm guilty, but I believe that in Christ you took my sins. I believe that in Christ that all that I had done has been paid for in fall. I mean, that's good news. Are you kidding me? You talk about freedom. You talk about living a fearless life. When you put your faith in Christ, what would you need to fear if you believe in a resurrected Savior? If you believe in a living God? If you believe in one who overcame death, hell, and the grave, then why would you ever need to fear again. The good news is this. Faith in a resurrected Savior gives you the ability to get over the thing that mankind has struggled with since the very beginning. God, like taking out a weed, he didn't cut off the top, he dug out the root. He removed the stain and the burden of our conscience to release us from our fears that we've held within that you do not need to fear there is forgiveness there is acceptance that is unending in Christ Jesus fear goes away when your faith is in a resurrected Savior because the foundation of a fearless life is believing in the one who overcame the grave